I can certainly join in Joe in recognising that we're now on Gadigal territory. But I wasn't sure whether that should come first or the one minute silent uh, requiem for the Liberal Party. <laughs> <laughs> if, anyone, <laughs> if anyone has a message that now we have Christopher Pine as, or, uh, uh, or um, you know, Joe Hockey as Prime Minister, you know, do let us know. It's far more important than anything we're going to say. Uh, health funding policy, it's a I'm going to talk about three parts, health, just a general policy, then focus in on private health insurance, and then on the current politics, although I don't know what current politics is a bit hard <laughs> right now. I use a metaphor for health funding. It's like an old country homestead. And imagine an old, an old country homestead, you know, Grandpa had it really great when wool prices were high, pound in the pound, and and built it in a glorious federation style. And then came the hard times, um, and a, a few lean-tos put on it, uh, and then a, a, another few good years, and someone with a completely different taste uh, did up part of it, but couldn't afford the rest of it. And yeah, what you finish up is with not just a, a mess, but something that's fairly incoherent, <laughs> except for the people who live in it. And when we look at healthcare from the outside, um, it is an incredible mess because one of the very unusual things about Australia, compared with other countries, most countries have what you call an embedded health system, like the British NHS. Even Margaret Thatcher couldn't kill that. America has got this ghastly thing um, based on employer deductions for uh, private health insurance. And uh, Obamacare couldn't kill that. In fact, it's now going back under. Uh, under the present president, forget his name, um, to, uh, to, to this old traditional structure. But Australia's not like that. Each government uh, comes in with this great idea of some uh, reform or change and brings in its own program but isn't going to kill the previous government's program. So, uh, yeah, so we've had these various things like um, uh, 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 how it gets in that keeps Medicare. Um, and then, uh, then we get the Gillard Rudd government. They get in, but they keep private health insurance. But when I say they keep the previous government's programs, they water them down a bit. So we, we tend to get a very incoherent mess. And, that, and that's why I use that metaphor. So what we've got are, are bits of universalism, bits of, uh, such as uh, public hospitals, they're free, and we're all free to use them. But we also get uh, bits of uh, what I call genuine insurance with cap risk, like the pharmaceutical benefit scheme, you know what you're going to pay. We get lots of what I call false insurance, where you pay something when you make a claim, you get some money back, uh, but then you're left with the open-ended risk. That ain't insurance, by the way. Uh, and of course, what we get is this, this is, now I'm going, to, I'm going to spend, do I have a couple of hours? Because I want to go through this diagram, it's how we fund healthcare, and it, it, all, all, fairly, all fairly clear, isn't it? That's, yeah, this is what we finish up with. Uh, yeah, something even more complex than the most complex uh, country homestead, and incomprehensible to the outsider, because we don't know what principles are there, partly because there is such a mess of principles. Insurance really should work like this, that we pay something from our own pocket and the insurer bears the open-ended risk. Um, and that would be the, the reasonable approach, that's what we expect. Um, and we get that, say, from the pharmaceutical benefit scheme. But what actually happens, and both public and private health insurance work this way, the insurer pays a set amount and you're on your own from there. So if it's psychology, Medicare will finance 10 consultations. And if you want the 11th, the 12th, or the 20th, you've got to pay for it yourself. Uh, and the same goes for the private insurers. Yeah, that red bit is what they call the gap, and that ain't insurance. Um, my friend and colleague, John Medici, calls it simply a bit of help with paying your bills. But it certainly ain't insurance. And we've got this sort of mess. These are the co-payments, so don't worry about reading out all of those. But you can see up the top, uh, who, who pays what? Public hospitals, pretty well free, all the green bit. Non-prescription pharmaceuticals, if you're unfortunate enough to need something that's not on the PBS, 
you pay almost all of it. And in between their private hospitals referred medical services, there's no, there is no rhyme, reason, no set of underlying principles in any of this. So that's the, the sort of mess we've got through having had, I'd say, 50 years without any scrutiny of health policy. And just to take you back, um, the last time uh, the government really queried how do we fund healthcare, completely open reference, was 1969, what was called the NIMO report. Some of you might remember that. Um, it was done in 69, it took years to do, and when Whitlam was elected in 72, they implemented a lot of the NIMO report. That was the basis of what they called Medibank back then, then later Medicare. But since then, uh, even though we've had industries such as the motor vehicles, textiles, clothing, footwear, even taxis put under the blowtorch of review, private health insurance has not been looked at. In 1999, the Howard government had a, a report which was to look at how to fund private health insurance, not whether to fund it or not. And in 2007, the Rudd government had the much acclaimed Health and Hospital Reform Commission, but in a political deal, rather dirty political deal, um, it was agreed that there would be no scrutiny of private health insurance. So it's, it's gotten by, uh, you know, for the best part of 50 years without scrutiny. It's just there. So I want to move on to talk a bit about private health insurance itself. And first of all to say we've had 50 years without scrutiny of those subsidies. Now you'll pick up, even quite well-meaning journalists will say, they'll pick up the budget papers and say, hey it gets 6.3 billion dollars a year. That's the blue bit there. What they missed in the budget papers is another 1.6 billion dollars a year, uh, which is because the rebates for private health insurance are tax-free, so that's tax foregone, tax expenditure as it's called officially. And then the really dirty bit is that yellow bit, uh, and it uh, doesn't all show up on the side, exemption from what's called the Medicare levy surcharge. Uh, now, I say about three billion a year, ACOS done the calculation, they say it's about four billion a year, but it, it's a huge amount of money. Revenue for gone, it's not recorded, it's, it's, it's not accounted for, it's just hidden there, it's something that you just don't see, and that is what really killing Medicare. Uh, yeah, add that up and you've got 11 billion dollars a year. I mean, 11 billion dollars, we suddenly talk about real money, and I've just, that, that would finance in one year the new subway line between uh, a, a city and Parramatta. It, it would finance um, completing the Pacific Highway and fixing up the um, Bruce Highway. It, it would provide a free dental scheme for everyone. <coughs> but, the main point I want to make is it's a lousy way to fund health care. It's, it's first of all high administrative costs. Um, when we take out private insurance, only about 83 cents in the dollar comes back by way of health uh, care. Uh, uh, whereas when, it's, uh, uh, when we use Medicare finance through the tax office, so we add the tax office cost and Medicare we get about 96 cents back, so only 4 cents on the dollar goes in admin. So, that, I mean, that's the first um, problem with it. It's not just the greedy bastards stealing our money, they might be that. It's also that it's just impossible for them to control those admin costs. See, two big mutuals, HBF and HCF, they do a little bit than that, you know, they're down around um, uh, 14 cents rather than 17 cents. but. It's still a, 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 a large burden. They've got to do it, even though those two health funds would like to be uh, charging less. But the biggest problem is a lack of capacity to control the service providers' costs. Lack of capacity to provide, say, the specialists uh, and the people who provide prosthetics, such as hip and knee replacements, who uh, they say, right, you won't cover us, another insurer will. And that's the weakness of having a fragmented private health insurance industry where there are strong, almost monopoly lobby groups. Um, so what we find when we look 
in other countries. That's a graph now. I'll, I'll explain what are on the axes. This is on the, along here the percentage of health expenditure financed through private health insurance. And up on this axis is the total health expenditure as a percentage of GDP. And what we find if we join those lines uh, with a line of best fit is that the more a country relies on private health insurance, uh, the more it pays for health care. And these are all OECD countries, in fact they're just a selection of wealthy OECD countries, but all with much the same outcomes. USA is out there, way out on limit, by the way, it's got some of the worst health outcomes among the OECD. Uh, so where does that money go? It goes into the insurers' profits, it goes into the specialists, it goes into lawyers. Uh, USA, fully 1% of GDP goes into financing lawyers who handle uh, disputes between health insurers and hospitals. It's a massively expensive. And not much wonder now that the, even in the USA now, 52% of Democrat voters say, we don't like Obamacare, we would like a single national insurer, as in other countries. So, um, yeah, we've got the clear, hard evidence there. But by the way, the countries down the left-hand side of that, mainly the Nordic countries, plus Canada, plus Britain. Good healthcare systems uh, and low cost. And someone was saying, uh, was it you, Arthur, saying that when the doctors ran, it was 1% of uh, their, their costs going in admin? Um, Tudor, uh, Tudor Harper, Arthur will talk about that. So, the other great myth is that somehow private health insurance takes pressure off public hospitals. And now, what on earth does this picture have to do with this? <laughs> yeah, I remember. Years ago, on Australia Talks Back, you remember that program when the ABC used to be funded, uh, and I was a so-called expert, and being an academic, I, I was gassing on and talking about allocative efficiency and all sorts of crazy. I wasn't just wasn't getting a message through about private health insurance. And right at the end, uh, uh, there was a call that came in and said, hello, I'm Trish from Tusmore. Now this is Tusmore, it's not quite Double Bay, but it's, a, uh, it, it's one of the leafier suburbs of Adelaide. I'm Trish from Tusmore, and I've just heard that academic chappy talking about private health insurance and I want to say that I have private health insurance and I used it for a small medical condition and there was a big waiting list but I got right to the front of the queue and you know I think it's so good everyone should have it. <laughs> anyway, I mean, the, 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 when the, that was the last call and at the end the ABC said you know her, you put her up, she's one of your mates. No, she, I mean, she made the point which I had been trying to make. It shuffles the queue around. That's all. And far from taking pressure off private hospitals, where the money goes into private hospitals, there go the resources, there go the surgeons, there go the people providing prosthetics, etc. So no, it does not work that way. The other myth of private health insurance, and you hear this all the time, uh, whenever, um, and I'm not the only one, there are plenty of us, whenever any of us say we should get rid of private insurance, they say, oh, you're talking about socialised medicine, getting rid of the private sector. No, we're talking about the funding overhead, the, this expensive overhead that churns our funds. We're not talking about getting rid of private hospitals, we're not talking about rid of getting private practitioners, uh, we're talking about getting rid of the insurers, but there is this assumption that the only way to fund private hospitals is through private health insurance. In fact, in Australia, we've got a very good single-payer model in the Department of Veterans Affairs. Good care, they're the single purchaser, they buy services from public and private hospitals uh, at low admin cost with good supervision of outcomes. We can do it, but we don't. And what I suggest, uh, does anyone need introduction to these two states? <coughs> I, I think we, we've somehow got the worst of two, uh, two systems. The worst of exploitative capitalism, in other words, companies you know, replicating what other companies do, some of them taking out huge profits and huge uh, executive salaries such as Medibank Private, some of them just struggling with admin costs, 
So we've got the worst of the market, all for a basic commodity, and we've got the central planning. Uh, you know, the Commissar of Health, sorry, the um, Health Minister, the, um, who's, who is setting a set of restrictions uh, and incentives trying to get people into health insurance. It really successfully combines the, the worst of market forces and of central planning. Um, you know, sometimes when people ask me and my colleagues, uh, you know, what are you in favour of? I just say something that's a damn sight better than this. Yes. It could either be have the power of a single national insurer or perhaps something where we've got co-payments uh, but controlled co-payments so that people can't bypass the queues by bypassing them through private health insurance. Okay, finally, current politics. Oh. Um, that's a difficult one. Uh, who, who's the health minister? It's it's um, it's Greg. It's six forty-five. Anyone know who the health minister is? Yesterday was Greg Hunt. Greg Hunt. Okay. No, no. Here we've got a history. Now, uh, so this will be hard to see. This is going back this century, and we see the um, uh, if private health insurance as a percentage of the population fell off under the. Um, uh, long period of the Hawke-Keating government. Uh, Howard gets in and boosts it, and we see that around. Um, th the boost didn't work immediately, but we, but it picks up after they uh, they bring in a heap, a swag of um, incentives, and it really was a big swag. I won't go into them. Starts to fall off again. Then both the Liberal and uh, Labour governments bring in a few more incentives because they see the decline of private health insurance as a problem. And look at the right hand end there, we can see it's falling off again as a percentage of population. But that's not the only story, politically. Now this is now a hard one to, to read. This is a value of claims paid per head by year, uh, per head per year by age. So, I, um, if we're young, we don't get much back out of private health insurance. But as we get older, we get more. So, you know, if you age, um, say, 30, you're probably going to get about 1,000 bucks back. Uh, but if you're age 55, you're probably going to get about 2,000 bucks. And once we're older, on average, you know, we get right up to $5,000. Here is the cost of... The blue line is the cost of a premium um, based on many bank prices. It's not precise because different different policies, but I, I've said, all right, we'll take out top hospital cover, $500 success, and take advantage of the incentive for young people to go into it. Now, um, anything to the left of 55 is profit for the insurers. Anything to the right is a cost. 55 is about the age uh, cut off. So if you're under 55, uh, you're probably paying for others. If you're over 55, you're probably doing well out of it. Um, and of course, that's why successive governments have been desperate to get young people in with all sorts of incentives. But what has happened over the last couple of years? Uh, they're, they're, you saw that graph about their falling percentage of population, but this is what's happened over the last couple of years in terms of the numbers. They have gained 210,000 new members and lost 230,000 profitable members. So I am making hazarding a guess that this is going to become a big issue uh, once a few other minor issues, political issues, I can't remember what they are, but they're cleared up. Uh, the other problem, of course, is the annual changes in private health insurance premiums. The black line down the bottom is net of consumer price index inflation. The line at the top is the actual rise. You know, the government keeps saying, hey, look, you know, we've had the lowest rise for many years, but that's only because inflation's been low. The real price rise just keeps going on. Uh, so, uh, and people are falling out for various reasons. Um, cost of living pressures, and then the various um, things we find in, the, in a big review by the ACCC, Oh, I've had it, and I didn't realise I could use a free public hospital. Um, my mate got free treatment in a public hospital. I didn't know I could do that. 
oh, I claimed on private insurance they had huge out-of-profit costs. What a waste. Or I haven't claimed over 10 years. I think of all the money I could have saved and paid for my own private hospital, bypassing them. So, uh, but we do have this problem of the popularity of uh, private health insurance. Oh, I don't be missing. And we've got this... Uh, it, it, you know, no one tries to defend it. Even Abbott, who was the second worst health minister according to the uh, doctors, guess who was the first worst health minister? Peter Dutton. Yep. He was. Uh, hands down. Yeah, um, yeah, there's just this assumption that it's a good thing and we should have it. Um, and then Labour uh, has got this really strange thing that, that they'll drop the subsidy. In fact, the subsidies are falling away under Labour and coalition governments. Uh, but they're maintaining this wretched Medicare levy surcharge where if your income's above $90,000 and you don't have private health insurance with a few uh, allowances for families uh, and a phase in, you pay 1.5%, you have a 1.5% tax penalty. Labor has promised to keep that to 2026 at $90,000. So uh, this is the Medicare levy surcharge threshold. Uh, and this is full-time adult earnings. Within uh, about five years, anyone on full-time earnings will be deemed a rich person. And by uh, 2026, uh, when um, Labour says we might review it, uh, it'll mean people, you know, even part-time workers, others will be subject to the surcharge. But this is a wretched, unseen subsidy. And with all the obsession with what appears in the budget papers, um, that uh, I think they can say, well, look, we, we can do this without hurting the budget. But really they are, because it's money foregone, even though it's not recorded, is still a cost, is still a subsidy. So uh, part of the whole problem lies in this obsession with small government. And I'll conclude by saying the other part of the problem uh, that, I, that I think is a real threat to, to health care or, or to Medicare is that when you look at um, the corporate sector in Australia, they look around and say, oh, gee, um, uh, no, newspapers aren't too good, and retail getting clobbered with uh, online stuff and uh, you know, construction industry. What's a big growth industry? Healthcare. Because we know people are getting older, we know that people are going to, new technologies are coming. And that is where the vultures are circling and trying to get into healthcare and trying to convince governments we can do it and spinning yarn saying we can save budget so if we can break from this obsession about the most important thing being the, our level of tax you know, where is the benefit in uh, but we, uh, we get conned all the time we're going to save you a dollar tax oh by the way you're going to have to pay a dollar twenty or a dollar fifty uh, for your health care because we are using it as a privatized tax uh, no if we now, people don't love taxes, but I can assure you it's often the, as uh, Oliver Wendell Holmes said, um, taxes are the price we pay for civilization, and practically it is the, uh, the most efficient way to pay for certain public goods like health care. Okay, thanks. Thank